the final piece, the end, the real icing on the cake. Let's get Chris Hicks up here. Let's get Leon back up, our trauma surgeon in residence. And just like before, we're gonna run through a procedure. The procedure this time is gonna be thoracotomy. Patient with a precordial stab wound, lost vitals, just as EMS is bringing them into your trauma bay. We're gonna run through it quick the first time, and then we're gonna have a volunteer come on up, and we're gonna run through it nice and slow, someone who has never done a thoracotomy before. I've done a few, I'm not gonna be the good novice here, so we're gonna bring up a true novice, and I'll introduce that person when we get there. Are you ready, Chris? Born ready. Are you ready for nasty commentary, Leon? <laughs> All right. Let's do it. We have the folks from the Chamberlain Group <laughs> providing this model, and this is a gorgeous model for thoracotomy. All right, let's go to it, brother. Beauty. You tell us where you want us. So we don't have to do the, sir, sir, are you awake? Head tilt, chin lift, listen for breathe. No, we don't do that. All right, let's cut this MF or open then. Yeah. Um, so team, I'm going to give you some instructions okay. as well. Scott, if you're at the head of the bed and I'm you're here. intubating, okay. a couple of requests. Um, once we're inside the chest, I'm going to ask you to intubate the right main stem and drop the left lung and pop in an NG when you have the opportunity. Okay. Leon, I know you're the only qualified trauma surgeon in the room. Nevertheless, I'm going to ask you to be in charge of volume resuscitation, okay? <laughs> so making sure that we have adequate vascular access and volume resuscitation is proceeding in line with the rest of the procedure. Normal saline. Uh, normal saline. Lots of normal saline, as much as you got. All right. So for this patient, chest is prepped. We are going to start with a left anterolateral thoracotomy. We're gonna start our incision well to the other side of the sternum, just below the, lip, the nipple line in a male, um, or under the mammary fold in a female. So we're gonna start way over here. First incision is straight across until you get just about to the axilla. Note that the arms are in the upward position and out of your way. And then once you get to the axillary fold, you're gonna to start to, sorry, the anterior axillary line, you're gonna to start to curve down, all the way down as low as you can go. Again, just like the hysterotomy, don't sweat it if you have to make more than one incision, that's fine. Let's see where we are now. Once you're through enough layers of the chest wall, usually your mayos, to pop through, and then with your mayos cutting up along that incision point all the way to the sternum, and then back down again towards the floor. Again, extending that incision as far as you think it can go. I'm actually, up. I've ended up just on the other side of where the actual incision is on this mannequin, so that looks a little bit cruddy. My apologies. Now, with your rib spreaders, you want this up and out of the way if you decide to extend this to a clamshell incision. The best spot for this is with the handle pointing down towards the axilla. Get this between the rib interspaces. Crank this open. This is where I'm going to ask Scott now, if he's doing airway, to drop the left lung for me. The left lung will probably still be in the way. And anatomically, you don't want to be fooled by the position of the diaphragm. You want to understand where the heart is relative to the other structures, and usually that's behind the lung. So even if the lung is still a little bit in your way, you're going to try. Here, let me just extend this a bit further. With my, here, it's cool, I got my curved. Um, you want to kind of just push that lung out of the way up and towards the back. Now, on this tray, it would be ideal if we had a long set of tooth pickups. We don't, we just have short ones here. You can see how working in a hole like this is a little bit challenging with a short set of tooth pickups. You, if you can do it, identify the phrenic nerve, but actually that's not really that relevant either. Just go as anterior as possible. You can see, or maybe you can, maybe you can't, but the presence of tamponade is not really clinically obvious here, and often it won't be. So don't necessarily fail to open the pericardium if you don't get the sense that there's clinical tamponade. You open the per pericardium as a matter of routine, especially in a patient with a stab wound. You can cut, or ideally, just tear the pericardium open and expose the whole surface of the heart. And this is a mannequin, and you can make out, team, I can identify an anterior stab wound that's bleeding, looks like it's left ventricular in origin. You might need to come over here to see it. My first intervention, having identified that, is to simply use my mighty finger over top of that wound to try and get adequate hemostasis. Can I plug that wound with my finger? Don't be a hero, don't go after this wound right away, just see if your finger is sufficient to get adequate hemostation. As you guys will all notice, this heart is still beating. And sewing a heart that's beating is a bit of a pain in the backside. So use your finger. And I'll communicate to my team now that with a finger over the wound, we have pretty good hemostasis. It's a little bit tricky in this mannequin, but if I can, I'll try and inspect the rest of the heart to see if there's any other sources of bleeding. I'll look at the lung, I'll see if there's any other sources of bleeding there. And I think the important point to recognize at this stage is we have hemostasis with a finger over the wound. 
This patient is going somewhere after this. The cavalry is coming. Leon is going to bail me out as the trauma surgeon and put sutures in this. You don't need to do anything further at this point. You've got a finger in the stab wound. You have done your job in terms of resuscitation, and that's probably a good place to stop the procedure and talk through it in a bit yeah, more in slow we'll, motion. We'll break there. And while the, uh, well, you can let go of that, that yeah. wound now. Very nice, very nice. Round of applause for that. <laughs> All right. So as they reset the mannequin for our novice, uh, how do you think that went, brother? That was all right. Um, did more, to I did more talking than I do in my normal thoracotomy. You mean you're not walking your whole team through that so that they're all on a link page of the... Uh, well, so my verbal instructions to the team are still what I said out loud to sure. you guys. Um, my kind of time goal is, you know, when I start to make the incision to when I'm in the chest, for me, it should be less than a minute. That's in my head. That's where I have it. Um, I try to have a few set things in terms of positioning, like the location of the equipment. I try and put my hip just in line with where the patient's uh, axilla is, just so I know that I'm consistently lined up the same way each and every time. And then the incision just went up a little bit wonky compared to where the actual mannequin is opened up, so that looked a little bit and, crooked. In real that's life, right. they don't have pre-made incisions, so yeah. that, that's not going to be a problem for right. you. Um, Liam, what do you think so far? Your initial impressions of uh, things you'd do differently, things you'd do the same? What, what, what's your feelings? The more I do them, is, is Leon's mic on? Is your pack on? Yep, that sounds good. The more great. I do them, the, uh, the less. No, he's actually not. Are you, are you turned on back here? Let's, okay. Oh, you got it? Hello? Tap? No? Hello, hello. Hello? Yeah. Oh, all right, there we go. The more I do them, the less I use the Mayo scissors. I tend to use the knife, the scissors you use right at the end. It even happened with you, because um, you went offline a little bit, and then yeah. you started using the scissors. So with the knife, I just keep cutting. It's really quick. All right. Hey. And, oh, well, ahead. the mistake I make with, I, I, the, I would agree, the extent that often what I see is people, I, I like the hysterotomy. I don't care if you make one incision, two incisions, six incisions. You're going to get there eventually. But I do see people stopping that incision a little bit too early. So they've cut, really, they're still kind of at the level of intercostal muscles. Okay. And then when you try and, if you were going to go to something like Mayo's to puncture through or a curve Kelly, it gets really cumbersome to go through a whole lot of chest wall tissue. And then you'll know it. You'll know if you haven't cut far enough because when you start cutting that with scissors, it's really, really clunky to do so. So if, at the very least, make sure you're using the knife to get yourself as far down in the tissues as possible. All right. Let's, let's bring up uh, Julie LaMonica. Julia's a nurse practitioner from my old shop at Elmhurst. She's one of my favorite people out there. Oh. She has never done a thoracotomy before. No. Um, she's also volunteering for the crash C-section <laughs> afterwards. I um. thought that was traumatic to watch that being pregnant, and now this is yeah. even more traumatic. So let's have a round of applause for the bravery <laughs> of coming up here and doing this. All right. So you two are going to walk Julia through her first thoracotomy. All right? Do Show me. Let's come on in. All right. We'll first step into the driver's seat. So you'll notice that we taught the left lateral thoracotomy, which I trained on, I'm comfortable with, most of us are. If you're doing a thoracotomy very infrequently, there is still an argument to be made for making the clamshell your initial approach, the bi-thoracotomy. So we're not gonna discuss that here in part because the mannequin isn't capable of doing that. The other message that I think comes from doing a left lateral thoracotomy, it's a bit different with a single stab wound to the left side of the chest because you kind of have a sense of where the injury is. Particularly with ballistic injuries, you don't ever want to let the sun set on the right side of the chest. You notice that in the procedure that I just took you guys through, I had no idea what was going on in the right side of the chest. So there's a couple of different resolutions for that. One is once you're in the left side of the chest, just sliding your hand under the sternum and opening up into the right side of the chest to decompress that. Or if you have a second operator, doing a finger thoracostomy on the right side so you know the right side of the chest has been decompressed. And then that person who's done the thoracostomy is going to be the person that extends that incision into a clamshell if that's the direction you go in. But what Chris did, and I'm on the same page, and we'll hear from Leon whether he is as well, is I will make my incision even for a left anterior lateral thoracotomy at the opposite nipple. Right. Because this, if you did need to extend, you wouldn't have to do a full clamshell. You could just cut through the sternum with whatever method you have, and now you have anterior exposure. Are you doing a full clamshell, or are you doing this method we've discussed right here? I always start my incision at the contralateral nipple so I can extend the sternum. I find about half the time my exposure is not good enough. I have to break the sternum. Yeah, so let's be really clear about this. This incision, why don't you take Julia through it? Yeah, so on I, this incision the surgeons will tell us that so we're... So right nipple. 
Right. They'll tell us that we're crazy for limiting our exposure, which is what we do. We make a rinky-dink hole, and that makes our job so much harder. So if you're going to start this incision, even though your primary point of view is going to be over here on the left side of the chest, you're coming right to the other side of the sternum, then even farther over um, towards the right side of the chest, and you're making that incision across. Okay. Again, landmarks just below the nipple line in males, inferior mammary fold in women. Something's happening. I want to make sure we see it. Okay, got it. We're good? Cool. And then the nature of the incision, Leon, please chime in here, tends to be a straight incision across until you get to the anterior axillary line, more or less. And then it's no longer a straight incision. If you come straight down to the bed, you'll screw yourself up because you're not going to be within the interspace. So just as you're doing, just curve that incision along. And the other um, sort of forcing strategy for me is I really try and move my hand down as far as it will go until it hits the bed. You want to make that incision as long as possible. So don't sell yourself short by starting at, or stopping in sort of mid-axillary position. Bring your hand as far down to the bed until it actually hits the bed and you're done. Okay. She's, she's already doing a full job. Beauty. Wonderfully. But I want to point something out. And this is like the most mild of points, and yet I see it screwed up so much. Which portion of that knife actually cuts? And you were doing it perfectly. Oh. You know, perfectly. <laughs> it's the belly of that. Yeah. And yet all the time when people are, because EM, for whatever reason, the 11 blade seems to be the blade we're most experienced with. But you could cut with the 11 blade with the point, but you don't cut with the point of that. And you're going to have a tough time getting through anything if you're trying to go vertically and pull it uh, using that point. So the belly of that blade, which is exactly what Julia was doing, is the way. Yeah, my sort of haptic memory is thinking of it like cutting butter. Like I'm holding the blade in a position where I'm just cutting through a slice of butter. All right, so you guys check stabbing. out where she is and advise her next step. I think All I right. need to go maybe a little deeper so, with this mannequin. Maybe. And again, the mannequin kind of has a pre-made incision under here, so we'll just see where you are relative oh, to that. A little low. But, no, that's, that's, looking pretty, <laughs> that's looking pretty slick. You're right on top of it there. So really, again, the, there's this whole layer of intercostal muscles. You want to make sure you're through that. If you're Leon, you're just going to use your scalpel to go all the way through. For me, I'm, I don't know, I don't want to cut things on the inside. So I still tend to poke through that last layer with Mayo scissors. So there you are. Mm -hmm. And that's already been done for you here. But right. you're going to get some resistance from the pleural reflection. So you pop through that. Mayos are nice because they're kind of cur curved at the end and blunt. They're not going to stab anything. And then once you're through, you're going to cut all the way up. Now, the key way to screw up this portion is to not respect the ribs and cut through it. Yeah. And the only time I ever got cut during uh, my trauma fellowship was uh, someone had done a thoracotomy and I reached my hand in there and they had cut directly through rib. It's super easy yeah. to cut through the cartilage or the rib itself. And mm -hmm. then there's something sharp, sharded and blood covered in there. Yeah, the so, curvature of the ribs, if you haven't done it, it, it can kind of surprise you. Like it's a really acute angle it, it, it close to the sternum the and then really, really curves back. So yeah, you really have to, in, to that point, you really have to respect the nature of the curved incision that you have to make to follow that space along so you don't end up having to cut through ribs to keep your incision because it's beautiful. Okay, you're so now you're through. I think so. I think and I was go, already from the previous yeah. Now, have you extended the incision as far as you can towards the bed? Because that is so. a, the other common mistake I meet, see, yeah, I is lack of exposure because people stop here when they should stop as far as you can. Yeah, again, I, I, I go until my hand hits the table and maybe even a little bit further than that if I All can. All right, now. All right. So this is the real nightmare of everyone who doesn't talk, do a thoracotomy Let's talk shadow disasters. Opera. Beauty. So, there are a lot of ways to screw this up, including the people that put these together for you. This one is actually kind of cool. Scott and I were looking at this before. Because the top handle is already attached for you, the bottom handle would really have to be wonky to be in the wrong position. But these can be assembled in all sorts of incorrect ways. Sometimes on some trays, they're not assembled for you. And before I ever did a thoracotomy, my personal nightmare was having to assemble one of these things on the fly and doing it wrong. Yeah, let's, let's make it really clear. These, this portion right here on a lot of the finishettos, probably the ones at your hospital, you should go look, are actually detachable. And it's very simple for them to be put on on the same side as the right. crank. And that doesn't work. And you have to then, in the midst of this traumatic arrest, take them off and put them back on on the other side. Have you so, ever had that happen to you, Leon? I asked the scrub tech to fix it. <laughs> nice. Oh, <laughs> scrub tech. Sounds so lovely. So two things to bear in mind then. That crank should be on the opposite side as the, as the blades. And the location, this is kind of style points, but if you're considering extending this incision over onto the right hand side, yeah, just think about the handle pointing down towards the axilla. Yeah. So exactly in that position there. These are heavy. Now they people are. are always tentative to crank this open and then they wind up again working in like a tiny little tunnel. You have you need a legitimate size spread if you're going to do this yeah. properly. The other thing you, I, I, I find you want to make sure of is that uh, Go you can, people can be a little bit uh, ginger in putting the blades of the finishetto into the chest. So what you end up grabbing is intercostal muscles. And then as you start to crank it, invariably those blades slip mm -hmm. and you lose purchase. So you really want to make sure that that curvature is tucked under 
the two ribs on either side of the incision. And then you can crank and crank and crank and nothing's gonna happen. All you're gonna get is a bigger and bigger hole, which is exactly what you want. All right, so now once you spread, what is in the real life the most common thing that pops into your face? Lung. Okay. Usually lung and sometimes diaphragm, depending on the, pa the nature of the patient's injuries. And I've been fooled by this before. Leon, I was actually reassured to hear that surgeons have been fooled by this as well. A tamponaded heart, which is purple and bulging, can look pretty similar to the left side of the diaphragm. And I've opened up the chest, seen the diaphragm, and gone, aha, that's the heart. And actually, it isn't. It's the diaphragm. So it should be behind lung, right? If lung is in your way, that's a good thing. You want to push the lung up out of the way and consider the location of where the, where the heart is expected to be, kind of in that central to left chest position. Yeah. So what I wind up doing, and Leon, you tell me if you do different, is first I push the lung down. Yeah. Because and it's kind you of down. It's actually deflate that bad boy. It's like a down and yeah. uh, up, down you, and superior kind of move. You movement. just shove it down. And then I want to find, I, if it's all bloody in there, I want to reach in to the anterior superior portion of that cavity, find mediastinum, and then clearly identify yep. heart. Yep. And then I know because it, it's, it's there un, underneath the lung and it's, it's dead center in the chest. It can't be anything else yep. as opposed to diaphragm, which is lying down. This here. sounds like a weird thing to say, but in the heat of the moment when you're stressed and you don't do this very often, a lot of things can appear like heart to you initially, so you really want to be sure, and your hands are as good as anything in addition to your eyes and making sure you're in the right spot. All right, now this is a goal-directed ED thoracotomy. Our main wins are gonna be finding a wound in the heart that you could put your finger over or simply relieving the tamponade. Anything beyond that may be outside the auspices of emergency medicine, and that's fine, because the reason you're doing this is to find a tamponade or a stab wound to the heart. So what is going to be the first thing you go for, therefore, is opening up pericardium. That's right. And, and it should be, go for it. And it should be a matter of routine, right? So whether the pericardium is tense or bulging or looks like there's tamponade, doesn't matter. You do the same thing each and every time you do this procedure. The only possible exception, I guess, is if you're going in to the chest specifically to cross clamp the order, which we'll talk about later, but that's incredibly rare. So in this circumstance, you are always opening up the pericardium. Now, People talk to you about not missing the phrenic nerve, um, or sorry, missing the phrenic nerve, not cutting the phrenic nerve. In reality, it's really, really obvious on this mannequin. I don't know if you can make it out yeah, here. Yeah, let's, let's pull the pericardium back around. But you can make it. They've made it a nice bright yellow stripe there, which is awesome. But in real life, traversing along the pericardium, now the phrenic nerve isn't always that obvious. Identifying it visually, to me, I don't think it matters that much. I, I think, I and think we're, the all, we're all on the same page there. We don't yeah. even look for it. We don't care if you cut as close to the sternum as possible. Right. So go as anterior as possible to the location where you're gonna pick up the pericardium. Is that, is that fair, Leon? I only see it half the time. I don't look for it, I just stay close to the sternum. Okay, so if you do that, you're gonna be safe. So forget about all that crap about identifying the phrenic nerve, because that'll be a stop point in this procedure that you're already petrified to do, and you're like, I don't see it, I can't go further. No, just cut as anterior as possible on the pericardium. Now you stayed very safe in mm -hmm. that you made a nick and then tore. Yep. Now is that your practice as well, Leon, or are you just cutting through? No, I make a nick and then I get the scissors and I kind of go linearly down and up in a controlled fashion because I don't want to rip the phrenic and um, a bit, you have to make the pericardial incision big enough to deliver the heart. I've seen some juniors, they make a small little rip and then they can't deliver the heart. Yeah. Yep. And that's, that's a, kind of a key element, that phrase of delivering the heart should be a, you know, a point of practice for you if you do the procedure. Think of yourself actually doing that, delivering the heart out of the pericardial sac to make sure you've got the whole cardiac surface exposed, the anterior and posterior. Oh, now, don't oh. mentally think that they don't have tamponade until you deliver the heart. That's right. I've been fooled. You open the pericardium, there's nothing. You deliver the heart, and there was a tamponade. It just yeah. wasn't anteriorly. It was stuck. It was clotted. It was whatever. Right. So you got to deliver the heart. Yeah. And the other reason to deliver the heart, because I've seen this error being made, is you could easily cut through peritoneal fat and think you're in. Yeah, totally. And the, the way to understand that is like when you actually get through peritone, uh, the pericardium, it becomes a real space that you could pick up and see something different as opposed to peritoneal fat, which just kind of strands off. Yeah. But the way to solve that is to actually get the heart out, and right. then you never have right. that question. The other thing, Leon, what do you do when it's so tense you cannot grab it with a pickup? What is your move there? I either, I either use a knife or I'm just pretty aggressive with the scissors. It's, you don't, it's pretty hard to hurt the heart. Yep. <laughs> you, just, you just have to keep cutting until you get blood and or heart. So. I don't know if I, I don't have the steady surgeon's hands to do this, but if you take that number 15 blade and kind of flip it on its back in a really tense, I've seen that, I haven't done it, I've seen it done, you can kind of slide the back of the scalpel sort of along and upwards away from the heart surface and make a small nick there. So if it's really tense and you can't pick it up with tooth pickups, that's another option. Yeah, if, if it's so surface. tense that you can't pick it up, you're gonna be safe to make the cut any way you want. So that, that's another move I've seen people paralyzed on. All right, Jules, you've already had the pericardium open. Yeah. 
So now, what is your next move? You've opened the pericardium. There was tons of blood there. There is blood spurting out anywhere. What are you guys so doing? So you got to deliver the heart out. So if it's not out of the pericardium yet, you want to bring it out of it. I can't quite tell if it's out yet. Looks like it is. Yep. So expose the whole heart surface. And now you've got this beautiful, gleaming, single stab wound. We should reiterate that the patient with an isolated stab wound to the heart in cardiac arrest is an incredibly survivable patient, right? Like if you're going to do a thoracotomy on anyone, this is not the category of trauma arrest patients that survives 1% of the time. Time, right? This is a category of patient that survives 20 to 35% of the time with good neurologic outcomes if you act quickly and definitively. And it's pretty incredible how much blood will be squirting out and how easy it is to stop it. Yep. Now, you put your finger on it. Jules put her finger on it, and the blood stopped. Now, wouldn't it be great to be a hero right now and just do the definitive repair? And, but that seems like a horrible idea. You've won. This patient now has a pulse back, and you could wait until someone comes. Yep. So putting your finger on and not in, you know, that's a, another common error is people think, well, if putting on top is good, well, then sticking it in, that, that's not good. That, that's going to make the wound worse unless there's just, you know, putting your finger on is just not enough. But you have your finger there, the patient comes back, stop. See if someone's coming before you decide to do anything else. Now, Leon or Chris, if you were at a community shop, you did this in the appropriate uh, situation of, you know, patient lost vitals either in front of you or very soon before they got there, and there's no one coming, but since it was a precordial stab wound, you yes. made the very smart decision to still open, and your, your mental framework was, if I find a wound in the heart and I could temporize it, great, and if I can't, I'm just going to stop. And you did, and you put your finger on it, and the vitals came back. What would you do in that circumstance where no one's coming, where you're going to have to ship a patient? Well, yeah. I can fix the hole. Yeah. I know you can, but come on, put yourself no, in their I, mind. I, I, I mean, I, I haven't I thought about this question. Yes. I mean, I, I really, if, if it's not bleeding, the emergency's done. You can hold your hand there forever. So you'd send uh, someone holding, which is very viable. Do, that's what you possible. What you want to do is start ripping tissue, not having the needle. That's a correct needle. If you're going to use a yeah. needle, use a 2 l proline. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be poking yourself. You want to have suction, visibility, a face shield, perfect. I mean, there's no rush now. Yep. I, you know, so if you have to fix it, you have to fix it, fine. But um, I think both of us, what I'd be comfortable doing, and Chris, is you go for it. Yeah, I mean, it depends a bit on the nature of the wound, right? And a linear stab wound without a lot of tissue destruction, if you have to close it with something, that's an ideal situation to get your surgical stapler out, put a few staples in and see what that does for you. Um, do, you, do you not I've like that? I've heard of it. I yeah. just, I, I've I, never done it or seen it. And likewise... Um, and I've actually found it harder than I thought it was going to be. Like, at the, when we were doing the hysterotomy, we were talking about stapling the skin. Staples are... There's different kinds of staplers. They're, they're a little cumbersome, so... Uh, yeah, so I, Scott and I differ a little bit on this. Actually, I'm not as reluctant to use a 2 proline in the right circumstance because in some situations, it's just a matter of, of a simple like horizontal mattress or a figure of eight stitch on a, on a wound that you can't otherwise get purchased with staples on. And again, same situation, you're done. I agree, there's no need to do that if the Calgary, Calvary's coming. Like, don't be a hero, and I've been burned on that as well. Um, but if nobody is coming, I think you got to pick the tool that you're most comfortable with in yeah. that situation, whether that's staples or a suture or in some circumstances a little reluctant about the Foley, but you can use that too. So now, unfortunately, in this separate patient we have, we've gotten to this point, we've opened pericardium, nothing was there. And you would be in your rights to just say, I've given it the best try if you're not in a major trauma center, and you could stop. But if you wanted to go further, what would be your next step? You've delivered the heart, there's no... Uh, no, nothing to deal with on the heart. No wound, no tamponade. Well, so I guess it depends on what you mean by nothing. I mean, if, if the, I, I've done that before on patients and they've had no injury in the chest and actually one patient I can think of actually bled out, they were completely empty in blood volume. They had a laceration to their popliteal artery and bled out their 100% of their blood volume in the field. Um, if you open the chest and there's blood in the chest, then that might compel you to look for things like lung injuries that you can treat, um, whether those are peripheral uh, lung injuries that you can clamp or more proximal major lung injuries that you have to address the hilum in some respect. Um, and if you have none of that in the chest, then maybe you're talking about uh, compressing the aorta. If you've opened up the chest, there's nothing there, and now you think the bleeding is in the belly. Again, I think this is something that we're all fairly aligned on. A lot of the stuff that you can do inside the chest is fairly simple, but cross-clamping the aorta is not one of them. 
I've struggled with it. I've seen experienced trauma surgeons struggle with it. So if your plan is to compress the aorta, I would get the word clamp the aorta out of your vocabulary and just, again, think of the magic of your finger or fingers reaching mostly by feel along the posterior ribs until you basically encounter the thoracic vertebrae and then just past that. Usually the first thing you're going to encounter is the aorta and you compress that. There are some things in your way like yep. the inferior pulmonary ligament that we can talk about, but that, that's my script. I start to look for lung injury. I start to look for opportunities to compress the aorta. And as we mentioned before, I don't want to let the sun set on the right side of the chest. If I haven't decompressed the right side of the chest at all and I found nothing on the left, I make sure I've done that as well. Yeah, why don't you show uh, Jules how to go across underneath the sternum to mm -hmm. actually decompress without I'm not totally sure how easy it is on this mannequin, okay. but you're, just, you're, you're basically putting your hand right underneath the sternum and pushing your hand. Yeah, that or... Yep. Actually, and the there'll be a, a couple layers of pleura there that you yep. just and you just through. You'll yep. feel some resistance and, and you just, just, you just yep. push through yep. it, yeah. All right, now if you did want aortic compression, maybe the heart's beating but there's no pulse yep. in this patient, that's a good indication to yep. get aortic compression because I think all three of us agree, really it's not the right time for cross clamping the aorta, right? Yeah, I agree. And yeah, yep. Chris has already said. So why don't we guide as the final thing here, Jules, through how she would go about compressing the aorta. Guide her through running her hand along that uh, posterior ribs. Yeah, so again, it is just kind of, I, I, at this point I tend to, I flip my hand around and I just run it, you'll feel the grooves okay. of the so rib. So the back of your hand your is running against the ribs yeah. and the first structure you see, and it's gonna be subtle in a collapsed aorta, yeah. but the first thing that's not ribs, that's gonna hit your fingers, you should feel a tube. Yeah, you might feel vertebrae yep. first, depends on how prominent they are. Yep. And then you're gonna feel a cartilaginous tube-like structure that yes. feels like an aorta. And then just, <laughs> I, Chris says a finger, I put three fingers down and yeah. just push. How, what are you recommending, Leon? exactly what I do. Yep. Yep. All right. We're not even going to discuss management of lung injuries, um, except, except maybe we'll say one thing. I think the hilar twist is a travesty and never should be taught. What's your feelings? I don't, I've never twisted a hilum in my and life. Leon, no. hilar twist? I grab the hilum with my, with my hand. That, yeah. that is, so makes a billion times more sense. So find the hilum. You could just trace the lung back to the mediastinum and just grab and squeeze. And it, again, it's like so much of emergency medicine and critical care is just don't, don't be an idiot and, <laughs> and let perfect be the enemy of good. You know, it's just do what's gonna get the job done and not have iatrogenesis occur. All right, anything else you wanna add? One pearl, I think you mentioned it earlier, if uh, large breast in, in, uh, memory crease, um, people still sometimes go too low. Remember, you yeah. can get someone to lift the entire breast up. You can still get up to the third. You can get really high up on your thoracotomy if you need yeah. to, like on a clamshell. Yeah. So don't go through the breast, not because, not just for aesthetic reasons, you're gonna, it's gonna be difficult to follow your anatomy. Uh, bring the entire breast superiorly and then do it in the proper place between the fourth and third rib or third and fourth rib. Now, now some of our patients, their mammary fold has been varied by age and lifestyle. So, um, the, and and so I always wondered, like, where should I go? Where should I go? Because this scared me. Because if you go too low, you can be in peritoneum and then that's less than good. So for me, the, the key, and I don't know who told me this, it wasn't my thought, but xiphoid process is now my landmark. Because yeah. if you could find xiphoid and you go one interspace above that, you're always right. And then that's where you're gonna start your cut, come to the anterior axial line and just curve up, and boom, you don't have to worry about breast or what have you. Just push it all out of the way. Higher all right. the better. <laughs> there, that is exactly right. And uh, someone in the audience mentioned, I'm sorry I didn't know your name, for crike, air low, for chest tubes and thoracotomies, air high. Yeah. Sure. Anything else and, you want to add, Chris? Oh, no, great work, Julie. Nice, nice job. Right, let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Julie and Monica, thank you. Thank you very much. The Chamberlain Group for bringing this model. Leon Budarakis, our trauma surgeon extraordinaire, and Chris Hicks. Right on. Thank you. All right. The question came, do you ever temporarily halt ventilation to collapse the lung? I don't. Uh, they keep going, but the main stem may help. Sometimes I don't even bother. The lung could be, just be pushed out of your way.